My name is David Montesano, and we're going to be discussing improving your transfer admission outlook, getting off the wait list today. And already we've got a couple questions, so we might want to delve into these just to kind of um, look at those right away here uh, before we get started. So let's see, we've got a question that says, are my high school transcripts necessary to transfer over with a completed associate of arts degree or an AA degree? Um, it really, the answer to that question is it really depends on the college um, and what they want to see. If they want to see your high school uh, transcripts, maybe the last couple years of those or the full thing, then, then they can definitely request that. Um, in general, it just, it's really hard to say actually. Um, it really depends on the college or the university, but that's a good question to kind of look and see um, on the college's information when they ask for transfer transfers, they give a checklist of things that transfers have to provide. You might want to look and see if that's on there, okay? Any other questions? Um, in the meantime, we're going to get started. Uh, improving your transfer admission outlook, getting off the wait list. My, again, my name is David Montesano. I'm an admission strategist with College Match, and I've got a company called Unifluence. And uh, yeah, you're welcome to ask any questions here that you might have about transfer admission. Here's some interesting information about transfer admission. It's, the reason I say it's interesting is that transferring is a lot like entering a crowded nightclub. Two people have to leave before two more can enter. And this data is really interesting because it kind of shows just some sample transfer acceptance rates. These are a little bit on the, you know, not, not completely the newest, latest ones, but just kind of gives you an idea. Um, you know, from, from UC Berkeley, which has a 23% transfer acceptance rate, um, to, you know, some of these schools that, you know, like, for example, Michigan had a 41% acceptance rate, 40, 40 for University of Virginia. Um, they're just kind of interesting to look at. Like, I think one of the more interesting ones for me here is the University of San Diego, sorry, University of California, San Diego, admit rate of 56%. And that's, you know, an admit rate that is actually higher for transfers. The acceptance rate's higher for transfers than, say, for admitted freshmen, which is closer to 30, in the, the high 30s right now. So at, at UC San Diego. So it's kind of interesting. Sometimes um, the rates can be higher, uh, but often they're lower and, and, and they can be much lower. And the reason for that is um, because there just aren't any students that are leaving. So the, the number of freshmen that are returning, that, that percentage is really high and that can, that can cause uh, fewer spaces for transfers. And the other thing that can cause fewer spaces is that everyone graduates on time and there's no attrition later, you know, meaning that none, none of the, the, the sophomores, juniors, and seniors, uh, sophomores and juniors primarily, but, or seniors as well, um, you know, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't go anywhere. They, they, they continue and graduate. So one of the things that you can look for, uh, you know, and U.S. News gathers this information is, Schools, um, you know, that have decent transfer rates, that's something that you really want to get a hold of because what you're going to find is a lot of colleges that are the more selective ones may not have that many um, options for you as, as far as transferring goes. And these are just a few, though, of the selective colleges that do. So I wanted to point that out. Um, let's see, we've got another question here from Renee. Um, it says, let's see, will you be discussing transferring from one four-year college to another. Absolutely, yeah. So um, there is a difference between two-year to four-year school and four-year to four-year school. One is that there's really not, um, you have a better argument if you're coming from a two-year school, if you think about it. A, you're more at risk for not finishing ever. Just the data show that. So if you're at a community college, believe it or not, colleges uh, that are four-year schools look upon that quite favorably and they want to help you out because they can see you don't have anywhere else to go. So you really need to be able to finish out the, you know, the next two years somewhere. And, and you, you've maxed out your two-year school. You have to go to a four-year school. So um, four-year colleges look at that. Um, and they give priority, I believe, in some ways to two-year college students, especially a lot of the flagship state universities, places like University of California or Michigan. Um, you know, in every state, you've got a flagship, basically. Um, Washington is an example. Illinois. University of Texas at Austin, that kind of thing. So, uh, but private schools can be a little bit different. Um, they can sometimes uh, not always give priority and sometimes give, in fact, priority to four, other four-year schools 
uh, that they happen to think highly of. So just want to let you know that, okay? But in general, two-year schools do have priority. Um, but four-year to four-year, we'll be talking about that. Maybe you can be more specific in your question, Renee, if you have anything else that you wanted to really know. Um, maybe the differences between the two and four year. Um, I hope I've talked about that here already, but if there's something else that I haven't addressed, please let me know. All right, um, so let's look at this next slide here. So um, I want to talk a little, whoops, what, yeah, it's a three here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how admission works. I think that might be helpful to kind of back up for a minute and look at that. So we know that transferring, um, it's, is something that's different from regular admission. We know that there, it's dependent on whether or not there's spaces, right? And um, at, and that's big states, bigger schools, state schools especially, tend to have more spaces. Um, there's just more people. There's more chance of not, and, and schools that where people don't return uh, as freshmen to sophomore year, um, or they don't return as sophomores, I should say, and and schools that don't have super high graduation rates in like say four years. Um, time, those are places where people can really look to transfer. And, and at some elite schools that we just talked about there, there were some examples of, of schools that did have a little bit more room. Um, but let me talk in general how, about how admission works. So there's a couple ways to look at admission. One is that it's just grades and test scores, you know, or grades, class rank, and test scores. And that would maybe include, should include your high school. You should think about your high school and including that information. Unless I guess unless the college says that they're not going to look at your high school information, but I would I would anticipate that most of the time they're going to at least want to glance at it. Uh, and your college grades, the two years of your, hopefully if it's one year, they're going to put more emphasis on your high school that that is the last two years of high school. And if it's two full years of college that you have and you're ready to transfer, you know you're going to transfer in as a junior, which makes sense in many cases then the colleges are going to put a lot of weight on those college grades, much more than they would probably on the, the high school grades. But no, nevertheless, it's important to give, to give them, or at least prepare to give them, your high school grades your, and your class rank um, and also your college grades, okay? And that's really, that, those are really important. The other thing that you can't always get around either is the, the SAT or the ACT um, testing, and sometimes the subject test, depending on how difficult the admission is. Colleges love to see these extra, you know, this extra information. And so if you've taken an SAT or an ACT that's sufficiently high, meaning that it's at or above their mean scores, then you definitely want to show that to them. If it's significantly lower, you might look for opportunities not to show that to them. And there are many schools that do not require the SAT. Um, there's a website called fairtest.org, and there you can find a list of schools that don't require the SAT or ACT at all. So if testing isn't your thing, uh, you know, and, and your, your scores are, 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 not, are below the averages of the, of the colleges you'd like to transfer into, then I don't recommend showing them your test scores unless you have a learning disability that, that's, you know, uh, kind of a mitigating circumstance or you have, um, you know, some other kind of medical condition or something that prevented you maybe from doing well on tests. Um, Something provable, you know, that makes sense that you can show, show them. Uh, the other thing that schools look at now, holistic, they look at things more holistically these days, is they tend to look at also things like your activities and what you did outside of class, especially in high school. Uh, but they'll look at things like your academic extracurriculars. You know, did you spend time tutoring people in math, just even informally? Or did, were you, you know, on, uh, doing things that were more leadership oriented, like being captain of the tennis team? So things like that matter to colleges a lot. Um, and to certain colleges, they matter more than others. Private schools tend to, and, and the smaller the school, tend, they tend to get a lot more into um, what you did in terms of activities. And increasingly, big public schools are interested in that as well. So to give you an example, the University of California, you know, years ago might have just looked at grades and class rank and, and maybe read the essay. And now they're looking at, they definitely want to know about your activities, um, your academic awards and honors, and your, your, your activities, and certainly about academic activities and then leadership activities too, okay? So um, let's see if we have any questions so far. Uh, we do. Um, so one question is, how likely is it to transfer from a community college to, UC, to a UC as a sophomore? And what requirements do I need to transfer as a sophomore. So by UC, you mean University of California, right? 
Um, so the thing about the University of California system, it's so great, is there's a lot of different campuses, right? So that means that, you, you know, if the more campuses you apply to, the better your odds are too, right? You know, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't limit yourself just to the, you know, only Berkeley or UCLA because, you know, you, you really want to give yourself the best shot of getting into a UC. And a UC, by the way, is a UC. I know some people might not agree with that, but fundamentally, uh, you know, it's pretty much the same if you go to, um, you know, UC Irvine uh, or David. Well, Davis isn't polytechnic, but if you go to UC Irvine, uh, it's pretty similar, you know, in a sense, going to UCLA or, or, or UC Berkeley. Uh, and, and or UCSD is very similar, too. And so, you know, I just I just wouldn't want you to miss out on uh, an opportunity to, to get into a UC because you're focused just on getting into the most difficult ones to get into. Um, you know, functionally, they'll give you much of the same stuff if you go to the other ones as well. But to answer your question, uh, the each UC looks at this a little bit differently. So what you might look at, there is, there are four, there's a 14-point criteria for getting into UCs. You might look that up, okay? Just look up 14, U, University of California, 14-point criteria, you know, criteria. Now, this is for freshmen, but I believe it carries over into the transfer realm as well because really they're, they're, they are looking for some of the same things. It's not all the same, but it's some of the same stuff. Um, you know, do you come from a disadvantaged area? Have you had any kind of hardship? Are you economically disadvantaged? Um, all that kind of stuff. You know, they're, that's part of kind of the tennis match that, you know, the get winning points in the, in the sense to get it, that it takes to get into a UC. So winning, winning admission to a UC is a little bit like a tennis match. And there's a great article, if you don't believe me, in the New York Times, I believe, about um, two students and, and that kind of shows you who gets into the University of California and how it works. So um, you might look that up too. I think it was Berkeley, UC Berkeley. But one of the things I want to mention, um, just kind of about the requirements, and then we'll, we'll move on, is that, um, and your question here about going in as a sophomore, it's, it's a little tricky because basically what UCs and what bigger universities want, I mean the research universities, especially the public ones, what they're really looking for is people just to kind of come in with the right number of units and just you know, fit perfectly into a slot, basically. So they prefer people to come in as juniors. So usually there's a minimum requirement. You might have to look it up by college. So if you're looking at Santa Barbara, it might have a different requirement than, say, Berkeley. But what you want to do is just figure out what the requirements are. And more importantly, and I've noticed this is a bigger uh, kind of hiccup or something that can kind of a hitch, I guess, is that um, if you're not careful, you can have too many units. So if you have, for example, the number of units as maybe a junior would have, you can be disqualified from even seeking admission at some of the UCs. Um, so like Santa Barbara, I know for sure, is, it has this 90 unit requirement. So if you go past that, you don't get even looked at by them. But, but, UC, but UC Berkeley doesn't have that, I believe. So it's really important just to kind of know each school's specific requirements around the number of transferable units and whether or not they have a minimum and a maximum. That's critical for you to know that stuff. Then you can figure out whether you can answer this question um, for yourself, whether or not it makes sense to come in as a sophomore. Generally, though, they want you coming in as a junior. But again, be careful of getting too many units, okay? All right, um, let's move to the next slide here. Uh, so, so you kind of have an idea of holistic admission. That Those are the new rules. I'd really recommend, um, you know, showcasing your, your, acti your academic activities outside of class. So if you're tutoring people, that kind of thing if you're president of the math club, or if you're doing anything with leadership, secondarily, that would be the next most important thing. I mean, that, you know, sort of like team captain stuff or any kind of, you know, leadership after that would be also important. Um, how does admission work in general? Here's kind of a competitive dynamic that I like to show people. So basically on one end, you have your dream school. And in this case, it's, you're, you know, you're looking at uh, basically getting into uh, a college um, through the admission, uh, the transfer admission process, right? So you're waiting for somebody to leave essentially before you can take their spot. Now, um, colleges are going to have other applicants, obviously. So in that applicant pool, as we call it, they're going to have applicants with strengths and weaknesses. And then you, on the other hand, are on the left here. You know, who you are as a person, your values, your core operating principles as a person, and also, you know, obviously the things that you need kind of functionally, like your educational, social needs, all that stuff. But more importantly, it's important really or critical to figure out what your points of difference are. 
points of difference really are a way of saying what makes you unique academically first and then leadership second and then everything else after that, okay? So it, here's where it gets a little weird because I know people, there's probably a lot of people that say, well, I'm great at sports, you know? Hey, I was too, but and that, that can be very helpful for you. But it's only going to work in this case if the, uh, the, that's part of what your college is really needing. And if you're being recru recruited as part of a, um, you know, a recruitment, a formal recruitment process with a coach, right? So, and you, there's no way to know that except putting together uh, a resume and, and maybe a video and, and sending it off to the coach and seeing if there's an interest. Um, but that can, you know, so sports can help you, but I, am, I, I, I traditionally recommend not emphasizing that as much to the directly the admission office the things that you want to emphasize uh, directly to the admission office are academic talents. So things like music, music's academic, um, writing, writing's academic, you know, anything you've done um, in the arts can be academic. Um, math, science, all that stuff. Athletics is great, but I would, unless it's like Olympic level, I probably, you certainly should mention it in the admission but I would de-emphasize it compared to stuff that you might have done in calculus, okay? Because that's just going to be more relevant because um, these schools are in the, in the business of, um, you know, they're, they're really about education. So anything that's academic is going to come first. Now, it doesn't mean that if you're not recruited behind the scenes, that won't help you. It absolutely will. I'm just letting you know that you want to emphasize. You want to put the academic foot forward first. Um, and I know a lot of people tend to talk about sports and leadership uh, rather than maybe say like informally tutoring somebody. So I wouldn't want you to miss an opportunity there. Um, here's another question. We'll just take a minute here. How likely is it to transfer from community college? Oh, wait, that was, I think that was the question we just looked at. Sorry. Um, here's the next one. Um, it says most universities that I've been looking at require the SATs, but would not necessarily the ACTs, would you recommend still taking them? Well, okay, that's a great question. So this is really um, interesting. So most colleges, just to let you know, take the SAT or the ACT uh, equally. So if you have an ACT instead, that's so here's a kind of rule of thumb. If your SATs aren't at or above the mean scores of, of you know, say like the incoming freshman, you can just look at their numbers then I would probably recommend giving them your ACT instead if you're required to submit a score and you don't have time to retake it. Because um, you, you know, even all things being equal, if your ACT is a little lower and you're on one of the coasts, if you're on the West Coast or East Coast, it's probably better to submit an ACT score because the West Coast and East Coast schools aren't judged as much by their ACT scores or judged by their SAT scores. Midwest schools are judged by their ACT averages. So that would be the opposite there in a sense. If Why don't you look at US News and we'll report and see what which score range the school you're talking about, the college you're talking about is reporting out on, on the, the ranking page, not their, their, you know, their kind of profile page. Okay, and that can give you a clue as to which one of those you should submit. All right, so this kind of gives you an idea. You want your points of difference. What's special about you? Say if it, my, my point of difference, you know, just I, I happen to be really good at math and that's it. I'm not good, you know, and I don't have any extracurriculars that are really significant, but I do tutor my fellow friends in calculus all the time. You know, they're, they're jealous of my ability. Well, then absolutely you want to emphasize that. You want to position that. Um, and position that effectively and showcase that and really describe that as part of not only your, um, maybe your academic awards and honors, can you can list your, you know, like top, you know, like A, you got, you got a, you know, maybe an A on a special exam or, you know, topic within calculus. And then in your extracurriculars, you should definitely talk up the informal work that you do as a tutor, and that can make a big difference. Okay. So how does the whole thing work? Well, and, and this is kind of, we're talking about admit rates here. So when you see an admit rate out there, uh, I just want to let you know that it's a blended rate. It doesn't mean that you're going to get in at that rate. So here's NYU, just kind of a sample rate. Um, it's a little bit lower right now, but just to kind of give you an idea, um, I think, well, actually, this could be fairly accurate for transfers. I have to go and look again. Um, but... Uh, NYU, say it's 30%, you're going to have athletes that are recruited, and it's largely Division three teams at NYU. Um, and so that doesn't require the highest level. You know, if you're, if you're, you could be a great player, for example, but not a Division one player and still get on NYU's team, their tennis team. Uh, so then, um, 
you, you could have athletes, underrepresented minorities, people who are Native American, African American, Latino, or Latina. Um, those are the primary groups that are underrepresented, for example. And some Asian you know, groups possibly, right? If you're Hmong or something like that, that could definitely help you. Um, and then, and then also, uh, so, and then legacies, people whose parents might have attended NYU as undergraduates, not as grad students. And those, those three groups, those flags and tags are going to get in ahead of everybody else typically. And roughly they're going to take up about 40% of the spot. So if you look at kind of the result after that, you know, the, the, the admit rate for everybody else goes you know, the chances, the spaces go down, goes down to about 20% roughly. So this, just think about this at every school, um, and it's more prevalent at private schools than public, for example, because of the legacy factor um, isn't so much of, a, of an issue at, at public schools. But just to kind of let you know that is, th these are all things you also have to consider when you're looking at colleges, okay? Let me take another question here. Um, let's see. How does one stand out as a UC to UC transfer applicant? Oh, that's a great question. Um, okay, so UC to UC, wow. And I'm wondering which UC you're coming from. Maybe you can let me know in the notes here. Um, but uh, I'm, you know, because there, there's there's one in particular where people tran tend to transfer a lot from, and and actually there's there's there have been programs set up, um, and that's UC Merced to kind of transfer. Uh, to some of the other UCs, um, and so they're pretty used to seeing Merced transfers. I, I think the number one thing is that you have to have a reason for it, a significant reason for doing it, right? Um, not just, I want to go to a more prestigious UC as I see it, you know, UC as I see it. Um, that's not a good enough reason, because again, they're all pretty much the same in terms of the quality, and you should really realize that. Um, but and functionality, right? I mean, some are different. You see, San, you see, um, Santa Cruz is, and you see Santa Cruz, and you see Davis are the ones that are a little bit different. Um, you see, Davis is a, more of a polytechnic; it's an agriculture and engineering research kind of university. It's more like Cal Poly or Cornell in the Ivy League, and then um, you see Santa Cruz is more like a liberal arts college. It's, I mean, it's it's a bigger version and it has engineering, so it's kind of more more and more every day like the rest of the UCs. But it was founded at least on the principle of having more student-teacher interaction, smaller class sizes, and residential campus, um, where people lived on campus and interacted with the professors more, much more, and fewer kind of commuting in um, happening. So anyway, um, if you can let me know which school you're transferring from and to, that, that certainly would be interesting to know. But in general, um, you know, you really have to sort of give them a good reason for transferring, I think. And a great reason is that they don't have at your school what you want to study. And they have it at this other, the new school. I mean, that just makes sense, right? But then you need to have to, you need to sort of prove that you're either in that field pretty heavily already, you know, uh, or you've got some, some credentials or qualifications to, to really pursue that new, new area of study. Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide here. So you get a sense of, you know, you know, again, 40% of the class taken up by athletes, minorities, and legacies. So, you know, it's just not as clear cut as you might think. Now, here are some of the, I wanted to give you some hope. So, you know, because I know we talked a lot about how, you know, transfer rates are, um, you know, if, every, if everyone's staying there, if they have high, um, you know, freshman retention um, that, and, and, and people graduate on time, that there really isn't, and they don't drop later off, drop, you know, leave later that most, um, a lot of those places don't have any spaces, you know, places like Stanford, I mean, you know, the, you know, crazy acceptance, you know, the, it's lower than 2% kind of thing. And Harvard, I think for a while, even stopped the transfer process altogether because they just didn't have any spaces. So, I mean, those are extreme examples, but I wanted to show you some schools that have high, you know, high acceptance rates for transfers because there are a lot out there. Um, you know, and these are some of the schools I think that are kind of, you know, some compelling, interesting places. Um, from liberal arts colleges like Washington and Jefferson to big um, kind of comprehensive universities like Arizona State to small liberal arts colleges, again, like Calvin, which is actually a good liberal arts, pretty good liberal arts college um, in Michigan to my, you know, massive schools like Ohio State 
um, Colorado State, po these are polytechnics and research universities. University of Denver is kind of a hybrid size school. Washington State's a polytechnic. Um, you know, there's a lot of really inter and you know a lot of interesting schools here to look at. So some and UC Riverside has um, one of the highest acceptance rates. So we just talking about the UCs if, um, for a couple of people there, and also University of Oregon, which is also on the West Coast. So that might be of interest. Um, let me take another question here. This person says, I know schools have their specific requirements for admission transfer. What are the general requirements for a four-year to four-year transfer? In your opinion, would a school give different priority to a student trying to return to their home state school system from out of state? Thank you. Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so let me break this down. So schools have specific requirements. She knows that. Um, what are the general requirements for four-year to four-year transfer? Well, um, I mean, Okay, so if you're talking about state schools, what are the general requirements? I mean, again, it's going to you know, depend on the state, and, and we've got a number of state schools here. Uh, so I wouldn't be able to, to sort of be specific enough about that for you, possibly. But in general, what you need, I mean, just, okay, so think about it this way. It's great if you have your high school transcript uh, and you have decent grades there, or, you know, there's at least an upward trajectory, right? Um, and in college, I mean, a, a rule of thumb for transferring is that you kind of want to have, I mean, this is, you know, kind of optimal as a 3.0, okay, or above to transfer. It really helps. Um, if you have a lower than that, there are, you know, schools that will possibly accept you, but it makes it a bit tougher. And the higher your GPA, the more, you know, more easily you can transfer from school to school, four-year to four-year school. So I hope that helps you. It's really driven by your college GPA, mostly, okay? And um, especially if you'll have about a year and a half to two years, you know, when you're applying or so uh, of, of college credits and grades. Um, it also could be driven by your high school, you know, grades in those last couple years as well, just to let you know. But the good news is that data doesn't have to hit their books, so they're not going to get too worried about that as long as your college grades are high. And um, I would just say it's, you know, if you have a 2.5 or better, that's great. If you have a 3.0, it gets better for you. And if you have a 3.5, you're pretty golden as far as transferring, in my opinion. Okay? So, you know, 3.3, 3.2, still, still workable. 3.0 is still workable. So it gets harder after that. Okay. Um, and your last question, uh, in your opinion, would a school give different priority to a student trying to return to their home state school system from out of state? Yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, you know, if you're um, coming back home to your home state institution, I think you have a pretty good, you know, argument um, because your family's been paying taxes and, and the majority of the spots at that state institution are set aside for, for citizens of that state, right? People who and taxpayers of that state. So as a taxpayer of that state, you know, by the transitory, pro you know, the property of being your, you know, a, a son or daughter of your parents, um, I, you know, who, who reside in that state, I would say that, yeah, your, your chances are pretty good that they will take a very serious look at your application and put you ahead of other people, certainly from other states, okay? Um, hope that helps. Yeah, because most of the spots, you know, I'd say usually it's over 60, in many cases over 70, in many cases, you know, even higher, it can, it can be higher. Um, you know, majority spots reserved for in-state residents, okay? And you don't give up your residency by going to another state to study uh, unless you change your residency by working a year before doing that or something like that, whatever that state's requirement is. So just to let you know, you didn't lose your state residency going, going to another state, okay? So these high transfer rates, I hope they give you a little bit of hope because there are some extremely low transfer rates out there, you know, places that just have, you know, 2% acceptance rates. I mean, I, among the more difficult to get into schools, 2%, 20%, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it's nice to see some schools that actually have, you know, above 50% in terms of transfer acceptance rates. They do exist, okay? All right. Uh, let's go to the next slide here. So um, one of the things that you want to kind of find out, I think, and this is, kind of, this is how to get off the wait list, um, is if you're on the wait list, think about it this way. So freshmen uh, are, are on, a, they have wait lists too, right? 
transfers here back late, latest, right, in the process. And then if you're waitlisted, you're going to hear back the very latest. Like it might even be like, you know, starting, starting time in the, um, nearly in the fall by the time you hear back. So you have to be okay. And, and, and it's, it's a little, think about it though, since it is so late, there are going to be some people that um, will not wait that long because they'll have other offers. So one of the things that you want to kind of find out, here's some questions to ask, okay, is to find out about the yield rate for freshmen at that school and the yield rate for transfers. And I, and I, I really, I can't stress this enough. This is critical because what it means is that the number of people that are going to accept their offer, right? So you can kind of find out some of that stuff. Another good question is that you should be asking these colleges, and you might have to contact their admission office to find out is, does the college or university rank the wait list? And you should, thirdly, you should be doing research on that college or university's unmet needs, okay? So what that means is talk to the students that are going there currently and find out, or go to studentsreview.com, which is a great source of information, and find out what's wrong with the school, what's wrong with that department or that program or that major that you want to do. What are the weaknesses? Because your job is to sell to their weaknesses, not their strengths. Remember that, okay? You'll have a much better result, uh, you know, if you do that, okay? All right. So any questions about that, let me know. All right, let's move to the next slide here. So I just wanted to kind of show you um, some transfer waitlist examples here, right? This is, these are from UCs, just so you know. Uh, and they're older. They're a little bit older here. Um, so UCSD had 2,756 students in their waitlist process. And 27.8% accepted a position on the waitlist. Okay, just to kind of give an idea. All right, and then here's an interesting, UCSB had better stats because a little bit more thorough. So this is kind of getting into that yield, right? And this is what you want to find out is the yield rate on the weight, you know, even on things like the wait lists, you know, and they won't be able to tell you that year, but you could say the yield rate in general, maybe for transfers um, the previous year or the yield rate on the wait list for transfers and the wait list for transfers the previous year would help you know, would kind of maybe help you a little bit. But um, 11,178 prospective transfer students to UC Santa Barbara and then 6,049 students um, were on the, in the wait list process, okay? And then um, it looks like 50, 54% um, 54.1% were um, were accept, accepted a, a waitlist spot or yeah I mean so so basically it's interesting um, that you can kind of see how many people accept it right um, or sorry sorry no maybe that sorry this is the wrong thing so 54.1 percent was were the people I think accepted from the waitlist I'd love to verify that um, it looks a little bit high but um, the UCSD number is interesting because, okay, so all these students were put on the wait list, but only 27% accepted a spot, right? So only a, a less than a third even, you know, went through the process of, of, of accepting that. Um, and in this case, I believe 54% were accepted from the wait list. Okay, and there were 6,000 on that that were in that process. That's what it is, yeah, 54%. So, you know, it just kind of shows you that if you if you're willing to wait it out to the last minute and you show interest and you let them know that it's your first choice and I would recommend letting letting them know saying to them look not only is it my first choice but if accepted I'll go you know because then it lowers their the risk for them it helps them with their yield rate okay uh, let's look at um, colleges needs in general right so they're not looking for you know angular students or well-rounded necessarily they want people that meet their needs and, and, and provide diversity. Now, if it's a private school, for example, and you're asking for financial aid, that can hurt your chances of admission, okay? And certainly it can hurt your chances if you're asking for financial aid and you're on the wait list. Um, so if you're on the wait list and there's a person who needs financial aid and there's one who doesn't, the person who doesn't need it is probably going to have the advantage going in to a private school because they're so worried about their endowment and they really want to kind of conserve their, their institutional monies. On the other hand, public schools don't worry about that, okay, because they're less sensitive and, and just, and, well, their job is to really help people regardless, um, 
you know, of income. They're, they're more obligated to do that because of the tax base support that they get. Okay. Any questions about any of that stuff? It's really important. I want to go back to your competitive advantage again. This is really how you get off the wait list and how you get in and all that stuff is really to look at your academic um, competitive advantage first and foremost. Certainly look at any leadership stuff that's also academic and then just pure leadership after that. Look at athletic, you know, ways of getting into if you can be recruited, recruitable uh, at a school for a particular sport. But don't put athletics on, on your application assuming that that's going to help you get in. It won't unless there's a coach relationship that's already been built, okay? Um, the college's unmet needs, really look in, at, at those closely, okay? And, you know, what are they? Just, you know, look at, figure it out. Um, you know, look and see what a school really needs by what their weaknesses are. Okay, and you want to sell to those weaknesses. And once you figured out all this stuff, what you know, how you're different, how you're you know unique versus other people, um, what the college's unmet needs are, then you can start to do the marketing process. Okay, and that's what I call the wait list response letter. Okay, so here's an example of one. Uh, you can write something like this. This is for Tufts. Um, you know, thank you for extending me a position on your transfer wait list. Tufts is without a doubt my top choice school. I'm interested in international relations, excited by a variety of courses offered within the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. This is just an example one, by the way. Um, but what I wanted to say with this is that this person, if you look at it, they say, I'd like to you know, update you on some of my accomplishments since submitting my application below is a complete list of my accomplishments. Um, you know, and this person got excellent paper from reality into absurdity, the martyr figure in Cameroon, Lugal, AP English, um, and, and the high school that they go to. Um, they also got uh, a 95% on the national Spanish exam. So these are things that they recently did since they applied. You want to update them on things you've done or something that's just so profoundly high level. So like something that's national, like the national Latin, ex I'm sorry, national Spanish exam is national. And even if you do well in the SAT, that's national, right? So and think about anything that you've done that's national, that's academic at all. And I would definitely put it on this list up at the top. Okay, so national things first then state level, then local, then, you know, then your high school, college level. Um, so this person, you know, ended up doing a lot of stuff, it looks like, right? They, um, they dedicated their senior project to learning more about pediatric oncology to help the nonprofit, um, their nonprofit, Alicante, support children with cancer in Argentina. I mean, these are all things that, you know, I mean, probably need more explaining, but just to kind of give you an idea, you know, and then and then you go through all this, and then at the end they, they wrote a positioning statement, right? They said, someone who thrives on creative thinking and an in-depth analysis, I'd like to devote time to explore my love for languages and the arts as well as my thirst for logic and pragmatic solutions. I'm passionate about gaining insight into different countries and cultures and, and creating this global perspective. And, uh, you know, I'm Latino, they threw that in there. So that's important too, you know, you want to pretty much make that, maybe even a bullet item if you're, you know, among the top Latino scholars at your college, that might be something you'd want to put higher level. Anyway, just to kind of give you an idea, this is not the world's best letter, but it's something that can certainly, um, you know, help, help you uh, get ahead um, of the pack, really. So if you take the time to write this letter, now what I would say, this person said, thank you for, you know, you know, I think I'll contribute well to this class and, and, and uh, at Tufts and, and the diversity there, and, and thank you for considering me. I would, if I were you, at a private school, well, actually any school, I would put here, thank you. I would say first, you know, this is my top choice school, and if accepted, I will attend. Because again, that lowers the risk for them to accept you. You saw how many people took the offer, you know, I mean, only 27% at UCSD even went to the wait list. And then, you know, the, even if they, they have to, and then that other, it was at UC Santa Barbara, had to accept 56% probably to get just a small number to show up. So they can accept fewer people. They can look more selective if you tell them things like this and you prove to them that you're really going to go to the school and accept their offer. Then they're, they're more likely to take you. It just makes sense. Um, it's better for them. Okay, they're, they're, that's kind of how it works. All right. Um, if you have any other admission, uh, sorry, let me, let me answer one more question here before we, or any others that you might have, okay, um, before we um, get uh, along too far here. Okay, so somebody wanted a copy of the wait, sample waitlist letter. 
Um, we do, I'm trying to think, where can I give that to you? You can certainly email me and I can send something like that to you. Um, also, you can sign up for Unifluence.com, which is a, a service that helps people go through the process that we just talked about, kind of the, the whole positioning process. And there are tools in, and in that, that that help you. Um, and certainly, if you um, want to, you can go to my website and email me. Uh, my name is David at collegematchus.com is my email address. And um, you know, if I'm if I'm able to, I I, can, I will send you um, that information. Okay. Thank, and let me if, let me just see if there's any other questions before we wrap up here. You've been a great audience. I appreciate your time and patience too, as we started a little bit later today. Um, okay, it doesn't look like it. Any other questions? I'll give I'll give somebody one more chance here if there are any others. Um, kind of last minute ones. It doesn't look like you've been a great audience, and I want to say thank you so much for your time and um, best of luck to you as in transferring. I know you can you can get off that wait list, so just focus on some of the principles we talked about today, and you'll be very successful. I think. All right, take care. Thanks. Mm -hmm.